first of all, let me wish you all a happy new year. I hope yours was as uh, encouraging um, as mine. This morning, um, I thought it was only important to begin the new year by first saying um, happy new year to my constituents and that this year will be a year of tremendous progress. Um, as you will be aware, we were the government which completed the bridge in Canaries. We are now about to do so in Ansari, um, beginning this week with the demolition of the, of the residences. It took some time to get to this point because we had to satisfactorily relocate the affected members. So the, all the five residences have been replaced satisfactorily. And hopefully this week, uh, commencing this morning, the process towards demolition will commence. There's also work happening on the Ottawa court. We've put in the lights, we've done the resurfacing. We are also working on the jetty in Ancillary. There was an issue with the bed and breakfast, and it's only uh, a few days ago the Prime Minister approved the budget to put in the sewer treatment plant. The previous administration, for some weird reason, felt it was necessary, uh, it was not necessary to put in a sewer treatment plant. So there's literally a pipe flowing from what would be a flush urinal going directly into the sea, which is something we could not countenance. So we did some work, and we have now been able to um, say definitively that we will be putting the sewer treatment plant and that the bed and breakfast in Ansari will continue in the, in the right manner. We are also working on the relaunching of the Friday Fish Fry, which we know is a very important initiative for the constituents of Ansari because of the revenue that it, it generates. We are also working to complete the NSDC building, which was a building that was uh, commenced under the last administration for the young people of Ancillary. But for whatever reason, the former administration did not believe it was important enough, so they stopped the works on it. But we have now confirmed that we're going to recommence the work on that, so the young people of Ancillary canneries, Ancillary in particular, will have a place to hone their talents and practice their skill, and meet to recreate, um, because we are not what everyone seems to suggest we are. We are we are more than the misfortune that they, that they suggest we are. We have talent, we have knowledge, we have uh, enthusiasm, we have the vigor. So we are essentially saying to the young people of Ansari Canaries, we believe in you and we're making that space available for you to do what has to be done. Moving beyond that, um, in the community of Canaries, as you may be aware, um, by the end of this month, we would have completed the works on the restaurant and market in Canaries. So we are looking forward to, to launching that and making it a great success. We've installed, we're in the process of installing the, uh, an outdoor gym in Jackmel as we speak. Uh, it's almost complete. We just need to do the surfacing of the ground now. We've also commenced work on the Montezo Bridge. And I, you would have reported some time ago that there was some issue with the Montezo Bridge. But the contractor has been engaged and work has already commenced, so that is going on very, very wonderful. We've also started rehabilitation works on the feeder roads leading to some of the very important farming communities in Jackmel. So the Delago Road Part 1 has been done, and we're working this week on the second phase of the Delago rehabilitation. All in all, my, my purpose here this morning is to reassure my constituents that a day does not go by if, we don't, if I personally don't consider what I could do to improve their lives. I did not get into this business to be called simply a minister. I got into this business simply because I want to improve the lives of the people and the constituency who raised me and made me who I am today. I have every, every intention on delivering on every single commitment, because I didn't make any promises to them at the election. I made commitments to them that I will do certain things. And I'm here this morning to reassure them that all of those commitments that I made will be delivered. Any questions from you, I'll be happy to take them before I rush off the cabinet to do the business of the no, country. Um, I think this question is not just for me, but also yes. for your colleagues. Yes. Um, we have not been seen much of you yes. um, in the in recent time. Yes. Was there any reason for that in particular? And what, what will we be seeing more of you in the future? Well, you see, I, I thought it was important, to be quite honest with you. Um, it's a very significant ministry. I thought it was important to be very honest with you, to concentrate on doing the best that I can there, to understand how the system works, 
it, it wasn't any deliberate attempt to avoid the media. I have no issue to avoid you. It's just I believe that I had to get my head down and get comfortable with the ministry that I was I meant to be functioning it. But going forward, I expect to see you expect to see more of me because there's quite a bit for me to discuss with you. So I look forward to having that conversation. Uh, any progress on community tourism? You know? Well, yes. Um, as you know, it's 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 a very significant um, initiative of this government. We have um, the bed and breakfast, for example, is part of this community tourism initiative. The works on the jetty is also part of the community tourism initiative. In a few weeks' time, uh, I will come back to you to give you the precise date of the relaunching of our fish fry. All of this comes under community tourism. We believe that we have a lot of um, products or sites that are available for us to develop. Because it's one thing to, to bring in the tourists and get them to benefit from our beautiful island, but I need to ensure that, with regards to my constituency, that we have attraction and experiences that the constituents could benefit from when the tourists come through. What you may be aware of, what you may not be aware of, under the last administration, despite the Member of Parliament for Ansari Khan, was the Minister of Tourism, Ansari was only seen as a rest stop for tourists on the way to Sufre. So they would only stop in, in Ansari to use the bathroom. And this is a very significant point. We were featured as a restroom stop for tourists coming to this country. This is not acceptable, and we will not continue with this operation. Ansari has more to offer other than people stopping to use the bathroom. Yes, sir. Um, will you focus on the youth? Especially yes, on yes. What is, what is the status of the sports, the sports facilities? Well, um, very good question. The Ottawa court, which has never had lights before, we've already installed the lights. We're in the process of resurfacing the court and marking it up for use of the community. When you look at all of the fields in the constituency, they are well maintained than ever before. We make it our duty to do it. Although there are days at times when, because the council of Ansari is responsible for the fields from Ansari all the way to Millet. Sometimes it's difficult for them to maintain the fields as often as I would like, but it is something that we recognize is important. So the field in Millet will be maintained very regularly. The court in Millet is also under, under review in terms of how we're going to improve it. Let's, let's be very honest with ourselves. When we got into government in 2021, none of those facilities were looked after. We were seen as not important. There were other things that were important to the other member of parliament, which starting the new year, we won't go into it now. But those are very important um, facilities to me and to the members of this constituency. We have a tremendous amount of talent in answer canaries, sporting talent. Um, and it is my, um, it will be my uh, intention to ensure that those facilities are improved before you come back and ask me this question again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the press, and Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you. Um, first, let me, let me um, thank you, of course, last year for, for providing coverage and asking me so many questions. Of course, um, I enjoyed the time with you, and I hope this year, as we continue to do the same, that I will always have information pertinent and important to to share with you or to, to share with the public through you. Um, this morning, I, I need to, to inform you that we, our income support um, to date, this, as of this morning, we have passed the 5,000 um, plus that have applied for income support. So more than 5,000 persons have applied. Um, the total amount to benefit out of the income support is for 4,900 thereabout. Just um, shy, but we've we have um, we have surpassed, and I would like to encourage persons who have not applied to do so because we need to assess. Um, we need to assess persons, and we 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 we, we um, ensure that all persons who receive are those who are qualified to receive. Um, there probably may be a few hundred persons that on the list so far that has been assessed um, that are not. Um, that need to supply more information, but in the main that a number of persons who are applying are persons who need the support. It also provides a window in terms of um, assessing persons who are informally employed, 
it gives us a window to, 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 to assess that data and how they are surviving in the constituency. And we as a ministry is picking up that data to see what more we can do to provide support for persons who are in the formal sector. So yes, I'm happy with this. We have paid a number of persons during the month of December. Um, we over checks, over 300 checks were issued. Um, and of course, there are still more checks prepared and persons are coming in to pick up the checks. So it is ongoing as I speak. So persons are coming to the ministry on the fourth floor and are collecting the checks, $1,500, and are going out to, to take care of their business and the food and what have you. Right? Yes. yes. Let's speak a little bit to the criteria for such funding. Who can get that? Okay. Persons from the informal sector and persons who did not benefit basically um, are the two important um, criteria for, for qualifying. However, um, that may capture a number of persons. So we look at other vulnerabilities and other deprivation to ensure that we address persons who are worse off. So persons who um, lost a loved one during COVID um, would, be, or would also be a, a factor to be considered as well. Um, and other effects of COVID on a family. So some house, ho households have applied, um, but that household also took a loan to bury a loved one and has not paid. We would consider this. A family member in that household may be inflicted with cancer. Um, so we would give priority to that individual and what have you. So there are a number of other deprivations or issues relating to a household that, in a household that would consider the applicant receiving. Um, the $1,500 in addition to the basic criteria as outlined. Yeah, um, we've not, but it's a matter that I personally have discussed in house. Um, with the permanent secretary, and we're looking in this year's budget um, not to look at just current um, fire victims, but um, we will go down into the database of the, the fire department to have a database on persons who have been affected by fire. And we are doing a research on it to determine how they have recovered, what has happened to them, and, um, and who are they in the main. So um, the last that I checked, we did, I, speak with, I spoke with the fire department on the database, they do have all of the information. So we will go back um, over so many years and do a study as to find out what has happened to fire victims. Um, and of course, to see what we can put in place in terms of a response that can be sustainable. One of the things that I'm happy about that the Prime Minister has done is to, to, to reduce significantly the fire report from 200 to $25. Um, so a fire victim used to pay $200 for the fire report. And can you imagine after you've lost a basic dwelling and you're only left with your clothes on that you're now being asked to pay $200 to the fire department for a fire report so that you can receive a basic you know, um, kit from, from, from the Red Cross or, or from, from, from the people of um, the, the disaster people who respond to the, to the disasters. And that has been difficult, but I'm happy PM has done this. So now you only have to come up with $25 really to co cover paper and printing to get the fire report. But that is not adequate for us, the Ministry of Equity. We continue to investigate how they respond, how they recover um, after the fire, because there are times that you have other issues if there's a loss in the family, persons who, who have had some fatalities, how it affects the households and what have you, the trauma what is available in terms of counseling and all of that sort of thing is things that we are currently paying attention to at the Ministry of Equity for fire victims. All of this, all of this, we are looking at, we are looking at this, and um, subsequent to, well, following the budget presentation, you would hear a lot more about some of those crisis responses, but we are 
considering looking at um, people in crisis a lot closer in terms of responding to some of these things. The ID cards, the, the, a number of um, important documents they would have lost and it's needed for them to move on. So we're going to work on that. But surely the distress yeah. fund comes in hand, right? Yes, the distress fund respond in so far as some aspect of, the, of, of people in crisis. But we'll do a lot more in terms of ensuring that we provide more support as a ministry to our fire victims. Yes, yes. So, yes. So, we are speaking. I'm speaking with the um, with the Saint Lucia Social Development Fund, and um, and I'm having conversation even with my constituents in terms of their dwelling home. I could say to date that it's cheaper to build a concrete structure than to build a plywood house based on the cost of concrete and plywood, and we encourage. And it's cheaper to build underground than to build on suspended columns. So. There's a culture of how we set up our homes. We need to have that conversation, and it needs to be done empirically so that person see exactly what is being done. So when I did check, um, it's about $80 per square yard to about $50 per square yard. $50 per square yard for a concrete block wall as against $80 per square yard for a plywood stud partition. And um, you could do it just based on looking at materials only. So this is something that we need to speak with our people as to how they set up the dwelling. But the fire department also prov will provide us with information in terms of the cause of fires. And if we see a trend in terms of fires have been associated with electrical, for example, problems in a home, then we, we would work with um, households and with the Ministry of Infrastructure the, the, as to how we provide capacity building and training and to, to, to allow people to become more sensitive to the issue of electricity in plywood houses, existing plywood houses and what have you. So we will be working with the fire department um, come this year so that we help fire victims. It's a matter that we have discussed with our STOs, with the Department of Equity, so that we could provide that support. The community development unit within your ministry recently finished the uh, <coughs> first phase of our mentorship program. Mm -hmm. I'll speak to the other initiatives like these and tell mm -hmm. us how well, the um, the actual content of the the, the um, fact of you you would find something out from the Ministry of Equity, but the issue of um, capacity building um, for our ministry is significant, and we have done a number of initiatives as it relates to providing that sort of training across Saint Lucia, and we will continue to retrofit our community centres to allow these things to happen a lot easier. One of the things that we, we, we recognize that some of our community centers, our HRDCs, are set up, but persons are not using it, the community is not leading. Um, so we will be working with the community-based organization to allow and retrofit for these things to happen. This was a successful one, by all um, indication reports from the officers, speaking in terms of what they did and how persons receive it. But mentorship um, and the, the importance of providing that support at community level is important to us and the work of the STOs. But you would find a lot more work associated with that initiative um, in this coming year. We will we'll be refocusing our STOs basically to do community-based interventions like this. So expect if um, I think we have about 10 social transformation officers across the island, Expect to see them in the communities, moving the communities along those lines, using the HRDCs, retrofitting HR, um, HRDCs so that these things can happen without spending much money. Let me ask yeah? you the hardest question here. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, <laughs> that is so. That is that is not the case. Absolutely, one of the things that I've respected 
at, at the Ministry of Equity is our proxy means test. I, when persons from my constituency come to me and they ask me, they say they, would, they believe they qualified, I ask them to apply. You apply online. It goes to JITS, that's downstairs, the, the people, the, the government website. The names are transferred to the NIC. The NIC goes through the names and ensure that these persons did not receive and then come to our ministry. I have not personalized any name in terms of somebody from my constituency. I respect those programs and I would love to see the government want for these programs to work as they intended to. It is sad that people see um, the work of this government by helping vulnerable population in a way that um, some people say that it's going to create a dependency syndrome. It's going to create um, as if persons will not want to, to, to move on. I disagree with this vehemently. No other group of persons work as hard to care for the family than the population who apply for the income support. You know, when you take our vulnerable population, look at the amount of coolers by the side of the, the roadside. When, look at the vendors on Astor Square. Go by the market. Even on Christmas Day and on New Year's Day, the vendors were with the tree trying to earn a living. These people deserve the support. When I ask, when I evaluate our vulnerable population, and I think they are a significant part of our population, 24% vulnerable to poverty, and we have another 25% living below the poverty line. And I really pay attention to what has happened over the years. They are not the ones who receive, you know, when they order um, to get um, the concessions, the large concessions that we give to our hoteliers. They're not the ones who receive concessions that other large businesses receive, no. And these people who receive those concessions, they depend on the concessions to continue to run the business. So when the government provides support in times of crisis, in times of difficulty to our vulnerable population, it is what a good government must do. Yeah, in regards to um, support, I think previously you spoke about a support program, um, program where it will be like a, an easier payment method for people that struggle to pay utilities. Yes, so yes. Well, well um, um, the, the, the Lucilec Department has given the undertaking that 2024, we will see the rollout of um, the prepaid electricity platform for vulnerable population that would allow or this it will sort of discontinue disconnection in the way that is being done and person that is one of the the benefits of it and allow persons to utilize um the electricity because they can see it's going down in a way that they can manage well um i do not know if there's any downside to lose select or the persons who have invested in the electrical sector in terms of how much money they'll make but certainly if we can consume less then it's better for us and it's more pro poor approached in utilizing services. And I hope thereafter that is not only loose select that would move in that direction, but other service providers, you know, see how persons use postpaid post phones as again prepaid. Persons who use prepaid have a lot more discipline in terms of how they manage their phone as against those who use postpaid, you know, and just have to pay the month and can't pay the, the monthly bill irrespective of what it is. So the same for electricity. If you can you know, prepaid your electricity bill and you put $50 and you know that's what you're going to utilize for the week because that's what you can afford. You will see this, you'll say, I'll not use the, um, the electricity, I'll not iron um, this um, um, today because this thing might just take me to, my, to the end. I'll just keep the fridge on and um, to, to keep some food. You will manage your utilities. You'll pay attention to how you consume. It is that attitude that, you know, the prepaid electricity has been... Um, suggested by Lucy Lake in 2024 that is coming that is coming through and I'm excited about having this initiative um, that way in St. Lucia. Okay well since you don't have a question let me just place on the record that um, all schools public schools um, reopened their doors this morning to receive students and I speak of 22 public secondary schools 71 primary schools and in the case of our early government-run early childhood centers, daycares, um, 20 of them would have opened their doors this morning to receive students, with the exception of the cul-de-sac 
um, early childhood center where we have a minor issue in relation to infrastructure that we're currently working on. Um, the reports coming from the various education districts indicate that students are a bit, teachers are a bit, and that most schools are progressing very smoothly this morning. Um, I expect a few disruptions during the term, and as most of you would be aware, our government has embarked on a, a comprehensive school rehabilitation program, and in the last six to eight months, we have committed, or Prime Minister has committed, um, approximately $25 million for school rehabilitation. Um, and that, is being, that money is being used in three separate programs. Namely, we have the, the TVET component of that program that we're currently retrofitting four secondary schools to be TVET-specific institutes. And some of the retrofitting that I speak of um, basically um, deals with issues where classrooms are being converted into studios, um, traditional classrooms are being converted into barber shops because these are some of the skills we want to impact to the, the, the students who will be attending those schools. We also are still working on the rehabilitation of schools that would have been impacted by Tropical Storm Brett. And um, most of, of the works under this particular um, line, the work has been executed and it's just a, in a few schools where we basically um, put in finishing touches. But the biggest of the free components is the 20 million that we received from the AFRI Exim Bank, where a number of schools had been earmarked for um, rehabilitation. Um, the work ranges from as a smaller component as a window replacement to the demolition and total reconstruction of school blocks. Um, case in point, the Enchibo Secondary School, that school has been in existence for uh, more than four decades, almost five decades, I've, I've been told. And we have certain wings at that school where, where the infrastructure is badly compromised. And so at the Enchibo Secondary School, we are looking to expend in excess of six, seven million dollars for the construction of a new block. In the south, the Plainview School is down for, for some major works as well. We have a, a timber block that we will knock down and that will be replaced with a concrete um, structure. The, the Piero School is also down for major works as well. We have had some issues at Moshi, um, at Grand Riviere. And as I indicated, this is all part and parcel of a comprehensive school rehabilitation program that we've embarked on, where in the last six to 10 months, the government, or should I say the Minister of Finance and Prime Minister has put forward roughly $25 million to treat with some of the issues that we have in relation to school infrastructure. The one challenge we are having is that as you know, in the academic year, you have three breaks. You have the Christmas break, which um, basically spans two weeks, sometimes three. Um, during the Easter break, as we call it, you have two to three weeks. And during the, what we call the summer break, you have seven and sometimes eight weeks. None of these windows gives you sufficient time to be able to execute the work as, as you'd want, especially given the, the, the nature of, of what has to be undertaken. And so we have found ourselves in a situation, and this is not the first time it's happening, where you would have certain um, infrastructure projects being executed at a time when the students are in school. Um, we are asking for patience, we are asking for cooperation on the part of all stakeholders to allow for some of those works to happen even when the students are in school. It has happened before and let me give the assurance to all stakeholders, in particular parents and teachers, that we as a ministry will employ the strictest occupational health and safety standards that we know to ensure that the children are out of harm's way even whilst um, those projects are being executed. We inherited a situation when we came into government where the school plans across the country left a lot to be desired. And the 25 million that I, I initially mentioned, um, it, will, it will cause us to ameliorate the situation at quite a few schools, but it is just a drop in the bucket in terms of what is needed to give us that total transformation of the school plant across the length and breadth of this country. But I'm extremely pleased and I'm extremely grateful that the Prime Minister once again has come forward and made resources available um, to the Ministry of Education to try and provide as comfortable an environment as possible um, within which children and teachers can interface um, and basically to help impact the national curriculum and prepare our children for life after school.
Education is a priority area of programming for the Philip J.P. administration. And this is born out of a philosophy where as a small island developing state where we do not have natural mineral resources, we understand that it is the quality of our human resource base more than anything else that will determine how St. Lucia fares in the international, um, on the international stage. And so at every opportunity, we will provide opportunities for our young people to access higher education. We have demonstrated as a country that smallness of size is not an impediment to what we can achieve. And we, we will provide our students with all the opportunities that, that, that we can get for them so that they can realize their dreams. And we have this program in government, in the Ministry of Education, where we are pitching to have one university graduate per household. Um, it might take us some time, but I believe it is a, a goal. It is a dream that is realizable. And it's against that backdrop also that you have seen an exponential increase in the number of St. Lucians who are accessing higher education. One such program is the, the First Generation Scholarship Program, which our government has embarked on in collaboration with Monroe College, where persons who are coming from families where absolutely nobody in the family has been exposed to higher education. We are saying to them that once they have the aptitude and they have the, the, the prerequisites to enter the programs, we will meet them halfway. We will make the opportunities available so that they can realize their dreams. For too long, there are young people in this country who have shown that they have the ability, they are capable. But because of socioeconomic circumstances at home, the parents do not have the means um, close relatives do not have the means. Those children have been left to languish, and it is the children of the rich and those who have the means who have gone on to university. With this first generation scholarship program, we are saying whether you're from Sufre, you're from Chozel, you're from Denry, you're from Grosley, Babono, Canaries, Ancillary, once you have the, the prerequisites, you have the aptitude and the ability, our government is meeting you halfway, irrespective of where you're from, your political affiliation, and we are giving you the opportunity to realize your dream, go out there, enroll at university, and graduate as a proud young St. Lucian. This is nicely coupled, um, or complemented rather, with another program we have with Monroe College, where we provide 17 scholarships annually, three full scholarships and, and, and 14 partial scholarships to complement the 51st generation scholarships. But we've gone further. And we're not working only with Monroe College. But as a government, we have placed on the record in the parliament and elsewhere that we have a moral responsibility to the University of the West Indies um, to ensure that UE continues to thrive as a flagship institution in the hemisphere, not just the Caribbean. For the first time, our government um, <clears throat> did put measures in place to allow people who are, or St. Lucians who are studying with UE away from what we call the landed campuses. The landed campuses um, being Keyville in Barbados, St. Augustine in Trinidad, and Mona in Jamaica. Traditionally, you would have qualified for economic costs if you were studying at one of the landed campuses. And persons who were enrolling with the University of the West Indies via the open campus, they did not qualify. This administration, in this term, we have made it possible for St. Lucian studying with UE via the open campus to qualify for government assistance. We have rolled out the UniPass, which is basically a program where we provide financial resources to St. Lucians who have probably embarked on their own um, on, on, on a journey of higher education, but they, they've, they've encountered difficulties along the way, and they're saying to government, uh, we need some assistance to finish. I personally am inundated with phone calls and messages practically every week, where you have a St. Lucian who has gone on his own or her own to, to pursue higher education, but the resources have not been sufficient, and so they're stranded. This UniPass program is, is tailored in such a way that, that a, a student who's stranded with one year to go, one semester to go, you can come to the Ministry of Education, um, you can complete an application form, and based on the established criteria, we will help you get out of your difficulties. And there's so much more happening. The South Louis Community, Community College Bursary Program is thriving um, for students who are 
who are embarking on post-secondary education. We also have the nursing program at Safa where we are giving a stipend to the students who are enrolled. And there is so much more happening in the realm of higher education. We have scholarships um, <clears throat> where we send our students off to Hungary. Um, the Moroccan scholarship has been there for a while. And the last cohort of, of young St. Lucians would have gone to, to Taiwan, I, I can tell you, is one of the, the, the largest cohorts um, in recent memory. So we are committed to providing the opportunities for young St. Lucians. And then we have those persons in society who do not necessarily need a government scholarship because they have the means and they have the security to face the bank. This administration, under the leadership of um, Honorable Philip J.P., our Prime Minister, very recently we went to the Parliament where we guaranteed millions of dollars um, that students can tap into at the St. Lucia Development Bank to pursue higher education. And again, this sits well with our philosophy that education is one of the vehicles that will take St. Lucia into the future, and education is one of the guaranteed um, means um, through which young St. Lucians can be given an opportunity to realize their true potential. The Prime Minister is on the record several times as saying that there is no St. Lucia standard, and there's, there are global standards that we have to subscribe to. So whether a child <clears throat> is from Ancillary, or a child is from Bexon, or a child is from Prale, or Margaret Tooth in Monrepo, the educational opportunities that we give to our students when they have gone through our processes and our system, that child should be able to sit almost anywhere in the world and, and, and match his peers, his counterparts, irrespective of where in the world that, that the counterpart would have been schooled. The Ministry of Education has been in touch with the SLTU, and we are in a position to um, show evidence where the SLTU was consulted on, on that particular matter. But, but we do not want any back and forth with the SLTU. I am on the record as stating that the St. Lucia Teachers Union is too important an ally for the Ministry of Education for there to be any back and forth for, for acrimony to be encouraged between the SLTU and the Ministry of Education. We value the SLTU as a partner, and I can even speak for myself. Um, when I left the, the classrooms to enter politics um, so many years, three elections ago, up to a day like today, today the 7th of, of January, I still pay my dues by way of salary deduction to the SLTU. And this is a reflection of what I think of the SLTU, very important organization in the scheme of national development. And there's nothing that I want more as Minister of Education than for there to be a thriving and healthy working relationship with the St. Lucia Teachers Union. The review is, is still ongoing. The review of the Education Act is still ongoing. Um, we want for as much as possible for there to be broad-based consultation so that whatever we agree upon and whatever we take to, to Parliament um, to be enacted, um, it will be a true reflection of the, the, the national mindset as it relates to education. So we will not rush the process. We will be very thorough. And as I said, very importantly, we want for everybody to make a contribution because this is not about what we think in the Ministry of Education, but we understand that they are very critical um, stakeholders and partners we're working with, and their input is very necessary to ensure that the final document reflects what we want as a country. So the SLTU, they had expense They have always, um, the SLTU has always been, um, we have always been available for dialogue on consultation with the SLTU, but I can tell you um, that moving forward, the SLTU will always be treated as a, an indispensable partner in this process. Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the press. Happy New Year to all of you. This year we'll have a very exciting and productive year. I wish you all the best personally and your families and your different media houses, wish you and your managers and your directors and your newscasters and your talk show hosts all the best. Over to you.
Oh, you saw that? <laughs> ah. First of all, the Okay, you saw that. Thank you. I didn't choose a contractor. I didn't choose. I, don't, I never choose contractors. So who chose the contractor? A procurement process of the Ministry of Physical Development, which are outlined to you here. Um, first of all, the custody suites is a project that showed the recklessness of the last government. They destroyed a facility that, was, that houses prisoners or houses arrested people, I must be clear, because you are considered um, innocent until proven guilty. That facility was demolished, destroyed, for absolutely no reason. When that happened, people who were arrested, there was nowhere to put them. The cells in Marsha and Grosile and Babono were, were always full. So the police had to take them sometimes to Sufre, to Ansari, to Canaries, sometimes as far as Sufre, or even Shrozel. That was not sustainable. So the police sometimes drove arrested persons around town for a line and released them up the morn and tell them to get their way back to Castries. That was what the United States Party left in this country, as far as arrested prisoners were concerned. That's what they left when they demolished the custody suites. That's what they left. Arrested people being taken for a ride by the police, a lime. So you're saying that. So? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm saying. saying. I never said so. I said people, I never said so. I said people who were arrested and had to be taken in for questioning, hold them back for a night or so. There was no place to keep them. All the cells were full, so they had to release them. All right. Custody suites. The custody suites project was conceived by a tender document from the government of St. Lucia. A tender document. That tender document was, it was sent out to four tenders. Four tenders responded to this tender document. An evaluation of the four tenders was done after a site visit that was conducted in February. A site visit was conducted prior to the submission of the tender documents. Submissions were to be received on or before February 8, 2023. Submissions on that tender document. <clears throat> Tendered and corrected amounts. Four tenders. Caribbean Contractors Company Limited, Rennes Construction Company Limited, IDC Caribbean Holdings Limited, Prudies Construction Services Limited. The confirmation, the confirmation of, these, of these bids has been determined. There were two unresponsive bids submitted by shouldn't call people's names because that's a private document, I'll say it. Submitted by Prudis Construction Services Limited and Rene Construction Company Limited. They were found to be unresponsive because one indicated that they would not be able to provide the financing for the project at this time, and the other had not gotten feedback from the consultants, from the financiers. All the bids were signed by each contractor. Then there is a comment on, on the rates, and there is a evaluation by the Ministry of Physical Development. That evaluation will tell you there is then an analysis of the rates. Each of the contractors, their 
rates were analyzed, each of them. Each of them. A recommendation. In light of the above analysis, we recommend that the contract be awarded to IDC Caribbean Holdings in the sum of four million five hundred seventy nine thousand and eighty nine dollars and ninety seven cents. Signed Architect, Financial Analyst, I Cultural Assistance, Engineer Cointe Xavier the government's internal procurement processes. After that, legal review, notice of assignment to the custody suites. Legal review, analyzed by the Attorney General and found to be compliant. You will not find the name or the involvement of any Minister of Government. Okay? There is not one document that anybody can show me in the government's records that shows any prior cost for the custody suites. Questions? I have no idea. What's a known criminal? One who has been, who is going to the police for engaging in criminal activities, one who has been questioned by the police. Okay. All right. Let us suppose th that is true. What's the mean of rehabilitation? So are we supposed to just cast everybody who's, who's been in province of the law? Just, just cast them aside, let them go and commit more, more crime? I thought it was about rehabilitation. I, I, I am not sure what you're talking about, but I thought it was about rehabilitation. Why are we going to, why must we cast people aside because they, they had a fault, they had, they had a problem in their life? People are supposed to be rehabilitated. I mean, many people have been, some are caught, some are not caught. I'm sure there are people who committed crime and who are out. Who are out. So you have no knowledge? I have no knowledge. Oh, you, let's, let's do the custody suites first. Yeah. Be because there was, first of all, there was no other site. And secondly, the judiciary had warned the former government, had begged that police and prison buildings should not be near judicial buildings. There's something called the doctrine of separation of powers. And if the two buildings near each other, it gave the perception that there was no separation. So the judiciary always complained that they did not want police headquarters near the House of Justice. That was a constant complaint. Now, let me tell you further. In 2017, the last government under Dr. Kenny Anthony, they had proposed and it got funded, funding for a police headquarters up La Talk. Between 2016 and 2021, the government abandoned that process. And they decided that they would have built a judicial complex and police headquarters on the site that they demolished. There is no document that says funding was ever procured for that. What I know is there are some bills, at least one for a million dollars, to be paid to an architect. And I have not seen the plans. If they're there, I don't know. I'm not saying I haven't seen it. So there was never funding for any 
complex. What was, the, what was there was the objection by the judicial people to allow the two complexes to be, to be next to each other. So what we decided, we decided that we would have built the House of Justice in the existing place where the, where the, where the courthouse is. But these buildings are going to be demolished. The Ministry of Education is going to be demolished, the old Ministry of Education, and we're going to build a complex there with an over an overpass, so the two buildings are going to be joined together. If you go there now, you'll see soil tests are happening in this, in this space as we speak. After the police headquarters, which we had intended to put back in the Latox side, the Police Welfare Association have been objecting. So we've yielded to their requests, and then we're going to be um, building or starting plans for the building of a police headquarters in the old site. That was demolished. That is the future for that area. So the custody suites are going to be very near the police headquarters, which is similar, police and arrested people near, near each other, so they can oversee that situation. So this is a permanent structure? That's good permanent structure. Yes, yeah, so complement the other. So that's going to be a uh, law enforcement area. And the, and the judicial complex is going to be by the, ch by the Catholic Church, which is always what they wanted. The, 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 the people always complained that they did not want to be near police headquarters. I have no idea. You see, <laughs> you know, let me tell you the problem in St. Lucia. Everybody thinks they know everything. Nobody allows experts to. My job is to create the enabling environment and the policy for government's policy to go forward. I don't get involved in choosing contractors. I don't get involved in measuring sites. I don't get involved in making pronouncements on things in engineering. I don't, I don't make these pronouncements. I've never studied engineering. So I, 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 only what I know is that we've given the mandate to a contractor who is constantly, and if you go, if you notice, there are, there, that was the procurement plan that was set up for the customer, the procurement plan signed by the deputy chief architect. And after that, there is what is called progress reports. Progress reports that comes to the Minister of, the Minister of National Security. Progress reports. That is, the, we, we see we trust our technocrats. We do, we do not try to influence them one way or the other. We trust their professionalism. So to so these questions, I, can, I, I, I listen and I take word from the, from, from the technocrats. So they, they give progress reports on the constitutes on the land. But let's say policy plan, like the Minister for National Security, mm -hmm. like you said in the beginning of the statement, that um, we have the demolition of the city, we have seen a, a gap where there was not enough holding cells, right? Not what? Not holding cells for, for prisoners. Mm -hmm. So the police would know about on average how many prisoners they would need in, in, in order to, so that you could construct this. Yeah, then, yeah. You would need to then you ask the police because they, they won't have built it unless they consult the police. But they would have consulted with you to let you know. No, no. What they would have, what? No, 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 no. No, it doesn't work like that. So you see, interference in the police has been a cause, has been a great cause for what's happening now. Interference. You heard how the commission of police was attacked, right? That's the problem. Interference in the police. That is the problem. The police have got to account for their work. What we give is a policy directive. We say we want the a custody suites to be built because we believe is that the holding cells are overpacked and police driving arrested people around, around the country is not right. That's all we say. Then the police decide, listen to me, we need a holding cell for 20 people or 40 people or 50 people, and then they say, that's it. And then the policy partners say, that's what we can afford, and that's where we go. We don't get involved. That's the problem. Politicians get involved in all these little nitty gritty in the, these little things that create problems because they don't have the expertise to get involved in that. 
You, you never, not because you go for an election or, or you're a minister, you become an engineer. Some people have become engineers by, I don't know by what. They become engineers, they know about contractors, they know about contracts, they know about consultancies. I mean, I got a story about consultancies, which, you know, is so ridiculous that I, I, I don't think it's good to respond. I mean, when people talk about consultancies, they know very well that the World Bank mandates that there must be consultancies for all the projects. You know what the last government did? They removed the World Bank says that consultancies must be tendered. They removed that part from the documents and they, they proceeded to give, to give the consultancies by direct award. I won't tell you who got the majority. That's the story on, on, on consultancies. They took it away. They took it away from the World Bank and they put it, did it by direct award and I won't tell you who, who got the majority of them. But all the World Bank, all World Bank projects is mandated that they have consultancies. That's it. Ask the police. The police would not be able to do that. That's their job. They would, they would um, direct us to do No, they, they, they will not do that. They will not do that. They will not do that. You know, when, no, no, no. You know, construction and national security of the custody suites was done with the police in tow. The police actually went there with the architects and they designed it. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know if it's a dark part. You know, again, we just, mis, we just mislead people the wrong way. Prisons are part of history. I mean, if you go nature, um, the heritage tourism, there's a country in the world where the presidential palace is an old prison. The presidential palace. We've got this thing about old buildings, which is basically peddling ignorance. This old building thing. We, we live in, in, in a time when there's re-engineering, where people convert these things into history, into historical sites. That's what heritage tourism is all about. To, to make, to, to take these buildings, reconfigure them, but keep the old architecture. That's ancient architecture. If, if you go to London, if you go to the place of London, there is ancient archi arch architecture which wasn't built with depths, that's right, but it's there. Yeah, it's in Mandela, yeah, all over the world. I don't know why in St. Lucia we've got these old buildings and repeat these things with impunity, old buildings. This is, this, is, this is crazy. And you young people must demand better. So don't, don't let people make these statements and get away with it. Old buildings, prisons are part of history. If a prison have dark pass, that, that is misleading. People take these things and they because in there you have the, you have the history of a whole generation. And yes, and so I just want you to I just want to clarify these these these, these things these things for you. Yes. As I said last night in my address, there was a minimum wage committee that's, that is formed by, by the cabinet. They have made, they've given one report to the cabinet. That report is being looked at. Then there's going to be constant and intense consultation with the private sector. And hopefully, before sometime this year, we'll announce a minimum wage, a minimum livable wage. Question. Um, can you recently? Who? Cricket West Indies recently released a fixture list um, for the upcoming Cricket World Cup. What do you think of the package that we got? Um, and what, what are you looking forward to? I know Cricket is one of your partners. So. Yeah, um, well, you, you, you always want more. 
you want to be like to have the finals, but you don't have the finals. What we have is, is good. We must make the maximum use of it. We're going to be spending quite a sum on the Darren Sammy grounds, also the Mindo Philip Park. If you go there now, you see the work that's been done, that's been done there. And, you know, we are upgrading playing facilities for the island. In fact, this part of our infrastructural plan, understand? We're going to be upgrading and lighting playing fields all over the country. And the Minister of Sports will make, make an, a, a, an announcement very soon of what's going to happen to football in St. Lucia. It's going to, make, it's going to blow your minds. Additionally, with this being the year for infrastructure, I know that um, some of the utility, um, utility companies, particularly Wasco, had some infrastructural issues in the past. Would there be any plans? Yes, Wasco, people complain that the bill of in Wasco mashes it up. <laughs> That's what people, people complain about. But the, pro the, the problem is, you know, these things go, you know, we've been trying to develop this country and we're developing a set of silos. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Right. The fact is, the pipes are beneath the roads. And these pipes are old. They, they didn't get old on 21st July 2021. 20, That's not when they got old. They were old before that. They were damaged before that. St. Lucia's water issues didn't start in July 2021. It never started there. They started from the, the, from the, the issue with the distilling of, of, of the Rosa Dam, of John, with which that story has not been fully ventilated. We're going to get, get a lot more about that, hear a lot more about that. That's when, so we don't, let's not pretend that Tanusha's problems began for water in July. It didn't be, it began a long time before. What's happening is that these pipes are, to use a better word, they are in need of repair. The pipeline from Gozile into, in, into the north of the country it has issues. That's why we had to close, we had, Vasco had to close it some time ago. There are issues there. We need to repair that. The investment in water has to be substantial, and that's part of our infrastructure also. Infrastructure is not only roads. Infrastructure is buildings, is water, etc. So Vasco is going to have that, that investment in that, in that major pipeline. But in the meantime, what we try to do is try to see when new construction is taking place, if they can begin to divert the pipes right away. And that's what causes a lot of the expense. So you said to myself, you've been spending a lot of money, but there's no road. The road is to move utilities, is to move the pipes, to move the electricity poles, to move the, to, to move the telephone infrastructure. So that's a problem. So we have to see if we can work together. So the Ministry of Infrastructure has to work together for us to see if we can do it simultaneously. Yes. Yes. And I'll take you there. I'll take you there. I'll take you there. I'll, I'll invite you. I'll invite the press to come and see these four computer buildings. That means the contractor has. I've told you back in this contractor thing. I've told you. I've said to you. I've said to you. I've said, to you, I've said several times. You know, you're actually looking for what's not there. No, no, I mean, people looking for what's not there. People, you know, people just looking for what's not there. There's, there's things, there's nothing there. Let me explain to you. The Saudis have mandated that there ought to be a tender process for the continuation of the works. I think that tender document is going to go out today, tomorrow, at some point. Right? That goes. But... An award was given to a contractor to prepare, repair, and prepare the buildings that were abandoned. We seem to forget that these buildings were abandoned and left for rats and rodents and, 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 and animals and grass. I'm not the one who left it. it they, were, they weren't even clean. They were abandoned. We seem to have forgotten that. These buildings were abandoned. Apart from two of them being broken down. 
they were abandoned. But the news I have for you is all the buildings that they call old would have to be part of the box. You know, this misinformation about St. Jude is, is, almost, is almost heartbreaking because the buildings that were left there, the buildings that we are using would be part of the box. All of them. So after they left it to, after they left them abandoned, they have to go back and clean them and fix them. But they left them abandoned, they left them abandoned for two years. This is calling to heaven for vengeance. Even though you don't intend to, you, you, you leave it abandoned, you let grass and rats and take it over and bats take it over, taxpayers' money, and nobody's asking any accountability for that. You, even though you don't intend to use it, you leave it, you leave it abandoned. I mean, think about it. Millions of dollars, and now you're speaking about going forward. Hey, what's we're doing going forward. Going forward, the contractor that was tasked by the government to fence the, the area, because you had to fence it. Because if you didn't fence it, it'd be, it, it that's why it got it, it, it got in that state. Because it was it was not fenced. It was open season. It wasn't fence. Irresponsible. High level of irresponsibility with the taxpayers' funds of this country. <clears throat> so here's what he did. We fenced it, and in that contractor was allowed to continue, and then the work is going to be evaluated by quality surveyors and an award will be given for the continuation of these works. That's what's going to happen. But I'm going to, as I've brought to you, for the cousin, I'm going to be the same to you for, for St. Jude. And I want to ask you to get the same documents for the work that was done on the box. I want the same documents. I want the evaluation by four community surveyors, the, the, the procurement process for the work on the box. If you give me that, we we we, we okay. Right. We're using, we are using two buildings from the box, yeah. physiotherapy and uh, dialysis, right? And then <clears throat> two more buildings, and then the rest is going to be the east wing. It's the surgical part. But when I take it, you're going to be very pleased. You, you're, going to be very, you're going to be excited and pleased. I know you like St. Lucia. Well, four have been built now, and the rest would be what's there. And then I'll tell you something. There was also a chapel. Now, we know you're God-fearing people, right? So you're going to see if you can get the chapel funded also. But you're going to be very happy for St. Jude. And then we begin work on the stadium almost immediately. Um, <clears throat> almost immediately, because, because in fact, we're going to be, I think in this budget, I will make a statement on the stadium. So these young people of this country will get back their stadium, which has been abandoned. Is the Prime Minister in a position to respond to or address the comparisons of gas prices in Sydney? Yeah, sure, sure. I thought, I thought somebody would have asked that. You know, You, we, we can't look at gas prices in isolation. It's unfair. You have to look at it. In fact, I read somewhere that a release on the United States Party actually agreed that other countries were suffering from inflation. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, it was very paradoxical that for that case, they actually agreed that countries in the OECS um, miss. You, you, um, Miss Zane, you, you read it? Tommy, you read that? You read that, that release? Where they agreed, where the United States Party agreed that other countries the OECS are suffering from the ills of inflation. You read that, right? You, you, have, you, have, you have memory loss. I know. I, you didn't read it? I don't get correspondence. <laughs> there, there was actually a release that said 
Lucia, like all of the countries in the OECS, are suffering from inflation. By for, so they have admitted that in Lucia is all the other countries. They are, that's fine. That's at least a rare admission of truth. Um, you can't look at the prices of gas in isolation. You have to look at the, the, the pricing of petroleum products, LPG, kerosene, diesel, and gasoline. Now, you also have to look at the taxes on these things. St. Lucia has no tax on electricity. It has no tax, no VAT on electricity. It has no health and security levy on electricity. It has no VAT on water. It has no security levy on water. You have to compare it to the other countries where there is VAT on electricity, where there is VAT on water. Then look at the VAT rate. It's seventeen and a half percent in these countries. Some places more, I'm not even sure. I don't, I'm not sure, as, as in there, but it's not 12.5%. percent so Lucia has the lowest VAT in the region. Then you have to look at volumes, okay? And you have to, you have to look at subsidies. When gas was at $13, the subsidies on LPG was less than $10. It was 7 something and 8 something. The subsidies, on, the subsidies now on, on LPG sometimes goes as high as $30. So this is what you have to look at. You have to look at the holistic picture. So it's very simple. You can reduce the subsidies on LPG and convert that price and convert and reduce the price on gas. Of course you can do that. Of course you can do that. But do you think that a single mother with five children, will have to buy a tank of 20 pound LBG for $70? That, that's what we want? Is that what we want? Prime Minister, has the cost of shipping affected? That also. Supply chain issues, that also. But you have to look at it from the holistic, you have to look at it holistically. The subsidies, we can, I can reduce the subsidies on LBG. Of course we can do it, but we believe that single mothers in particular and lower income households, we can't allow, allow them to pay $70 for a tank at 20 pounds of gas. We can't. So you have to look at this gas thing holistically. And the, the price of gas in Dominica was always cheaper than the St. Lucia. It's, it's not, it's, that didn't happen now. We seem to believe that, that the world started on 21st July. The world was there before that. It was always cheaper than St. Lucia. But we are reviewing every day, and I can assure you, as soon as I believe and the cabinet concurs that there ought to be adjustments in the price of fuel, we will do it. That's what we're all about. We were not the ones who put the 150 extra. We were not the ones who did that. Again, you see, we simply forget that. We were not the ones who increased gas taxes by 150. We were the ones who did that. But I can assure you that as soon as the situation changes, we are going to look at the price of gas and the pumps. Is there still the 150 on gas? Yes. It has not been removed. And if you didn't say it, it's in the lockbox. Because you never found that lockbox. Okay? So, take care. Bye-bye.